Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Um, so usually AI talks kind of suck, so I'm going to try to make it not suck. Uh, and I'm also going to not mention chat GPT at all. So if you guys think there's another, it's a challenge, and I accept it. Uh, we're going to get into it. But first, I had a little story, which is that um, I got my credit card stolen a couple weeks ago. Somebody in New York bought a pair of Crocs. What's amazing about the story is the credit card company caught on to it, and they shut down the account, right? They sent me a note, hey, you know, somebody used your card and all that stuff, and awesome, cool, great. Okay, but then I hop on an airplane, and I come to Barcelona. I've never been here, right? I live in Michigan. I'm way far from home. They don't shut down my card. Like, how does the credit card company know that some dude in New York bought Crocs? There's 441 million card holders in the US. I looked it up. How do they know some dude buying Crocs is not me? They should know that, because I would never be caught dead in Crocs. But somebody in Barcelona using my card, right, is actually me. And we know how to do this, right? They have AI. They have really advanced AI. This AI has existed for a long time. This is not new. It just hasn't been accessible. So I want to show you not how to write product descriptions or some crap like that. Actually, how to usefully use AI in your product. So first of all, we talked about user journey. A lot of people use the word user journey. But like, what is a user journey? Um, I can tell you what it's not. That is not a user journey. This is the lie that we have been sold, that this is a user journey. But what I just explained to you with the credit card, where I, you know, I, there's a random purchase somewhere, but then all of a sudden I'm across the world. Like our, our customers do that, our users do that. It may not be that they're flying across the world, but they're unique. They don't fit into like a standard journey like this. The problem is this is what the tools give us, because this is the best that they can do, right? So it's a compromise. This doesn't enable us. This holds us back. This is not a user journey. This is a flow chart. That's a flow chart. I use this one a lot. Um, flow charts are good for simple things and simple decisions, but they're not, they don't capture the complexity that we have to work with with our users, right? Um, and I don't think that that is like new news to anybody, right? Okay, and this is what it looks like when you put a user through a flow chart, because let's be clear, it's not a user journey, and this is gonna be really awkward. I hope Blinkist folks are out back and not in here. Um, I'm not bashing Blinkist, I have Blinkist. I am an avid subscriber and listener, but this is a really good example, I feel like. And again, I hope they're outside. So 9 a.m., you get your daily pick. Yeah, it says daily blink is ready. Just pretend it says blink and I didn't get auto-corrected. Uh, summary to a book, great. Then the next day, I get your daily blink is ready. Another book summary. And then the next day at 9 a.m., I get your daily blink is ready. Another book summary. And then the next day at 9 a.m., I get your daily blink is ready. Another book summary. And then th I could really fill the, I won't, I won't put you through this. Um, but you get the point, right? And something I do, which is fun, we collect, we analyze all this stuff, so I get to read thousands of push notifications that are sent across time, but all at one time. Try that sometime, it's amazing. Okay, so 9 a.m., just in this example, is a terrible time for me. It used to be a good time. It's not a good time. I start work at eight, I'm not checking my phone at nine. I might not pick it up until like three, right? So by the time I get it, I ignore it, they get buried, there's like 8,000 YouTube things that pop up in between this and that, right? Um, I also don't have time to listen every day, and this is a big one. If I can't listen every day, but I have this push, I feel guilty. I feel bad. Am I using my subscription? I haven't listened in three days, like, but I get this daily reminder, and it, it bothers me. I wonder, should I, am I getting my value? Should I uninstall it? Like, am I really using it? Um, also, very similar messaging. This is a cognitive thing, right? When we see repetitive stimuli, we ignore it. So we got to really pay attention, because our user experience is different than what it looks like in our flowchart. So uh, people just ignore this because I think oh, I might have already read that. Or like, I'm used to seeing this, so it's old news. And that's how I feel. <laughs> OK, but flowcharts are what we've been forced to build user journeys in, right? This isn't our fault. We know that it can be better. We just kind of, how do we do that thing, right? And that's what we want to talk about today. Again, we analyze this for all kinds of apps. We have hundreds and thousands of messages being looked at. Something that's very interesting, this view you may not get a lot from, although there's our strong and steady Blinkist at the bottom. But if I break this down by time, like time of day that they're sent, it, it gets really interesting. Um, so we have some streaming media folks, so they can relate with this. The CW thinks you only watch TV between six and nine. 
Uh, Blinkist thinks you only read at 9 a.m. Ted thinks you're only interested in things at 6 and 9, right? No other interesting thoughts any other time of day, please. Especially not before coffee. Uh, and DoorDash I put in there for fun. They have it, they send all their messages at lunch and dinner because that is the only time that humans eat. Surprise. But are our users' lives really like this simple? Can we really boil it down to like that? Well, no. So how do we make our user journeys and our users like meaningfully connect, right? Because that's what we all really want to do. Um, so before I go on, I've already just said a lot. Who the heck are we? Um, we are AMP. We are an AI native CRM platform. So we're not a CRM platform that like puts a little cute chat GPT AI wrapper. If we don't have AI, our product doesn't work. It's built on AI. Um, we were formed by a data scientist, a PhD neuroscientist, and a PhD anthropologist. My T ended up all the way down there. Um, my joke is if you had an anthropologist, a, a neuroscientist, and somebody who did behavioral economics, if they all had a baby, that is AMP. Um, yeah, and we've just been featured in Forbes. We were just featured in TechCrunch uh, as well, which is pretty cool. So we know people, we know data really well. We have a lot of pictures and visualizations we're going to hop into. If you want any more detail on any of this or more pictures or visualizations, ask the data scientists. You will never be able to escape. So what we see is typically there's three main buckets of messaging, if I could say. We have our ad hoc messages. Right, especially in like e-com, sale today, sale today, sale today, tomorrow, sale. Um, we have our user journeys that we talked about, and then when you get like wicked awesome, then you start doing triggered campaigns, which is like I purchased, I churn, you know, whatever churn means, uh, I did a thing, I send you a campaign. What we're working on, what we've launched, is using propensity models. So, do any of you know propensity models? Have you used them? Heard of them? Okay. All the data scientists are like, that's old news. I'm like, no, it's kind of exciting. So propensity is a data back prediction of what a user will do. So instead of looking at the past, they did purchase, they did add to wish list, they did subscribe. I'm looking at the likelihood that they will do something. What is the likelihood that they will churn? And this is cool, because it allows you to do like all kinds of cool stuff. So we calculate it by taking your event stream, your full event stream. I do not skip anything. Um, kind of like uh, Thomas and Vanessa said earlier, you can't just look at three events. We don't. We take all of them. So take everything you have in Amplitude, everything you have in Segment, everything you have at BigQuery, I don't care. Give it to us, all of it. And we run it through a model with a goal. So like, if I give all of this data, what is the odds or what patterns can I find that a user will be around in a month, for example, or that they will make a purchase, or that they will whatever. So I wanted to show you some examples. I think that'll be easier to kind of get the concept other than smoke and mirrors. Um, so what is the biggest indicator of retention for a fitness app? I see the heavy guys talking to you. Um, most people think it's workouts. So that's what your messaging says. That's how I can tell, right? Do a workout. Don't forget your workout. Don't forget your workout. And sometimes you can kind of do that Blinkist thing, where like if I miss a workout for three days in a row, I feel like a failure. So I'm gone. We actually found real data that it's hitting the share button is the highest indicator of retention. So the way you read this is if you hit the share button on your first day, there's a 91.1% chance, and a million more decimals, that you'll actually be around next month. So this is cool, and I think of what Oriel just said with their app, um, like goal setting. But we don't want to make it too easy. Well, sharing is actually kind of interesting, because it's accountability. Once I share that I'm running, or I share that I'm working out, if I stop, other people might say, hey, Weren't, weren't you running? Weren't you working out? Did you say, what's going on, man? Um, so it's, it's adding accountability. It totally makes sense. But like at first, you know, this probably wouldn't be our first inclination of what we think encourages retention. Another good one is uh, your Apple Watch battery level change. So if you connect your watch, you're more likely to stick around. And they probably know that stuff too. Um, oh, it didn't start at the beginning of the GIF. That's one of my favorite ones. Anyway. The other one, what's the biggest indicator of churn for the same app? This is just fun info. Uh, if you sign in with Google or Facebook, you are more likely to leave than if you create a native login. This should kind of make sense. Uh, or if you uh, update your application or send a what's new modal on somebody's first day, that's not really a good look. You don't have to change anything. This is just information. But you can get it really quick, kind of like Thomas talked about earlier with uh, reducing your customer acquisition cost to payback, right? I'm just trying to get insights faster. And this, we could 
pull this data in like two days. All right, what's the biggest indicator of churn for a gaming app? Another couple fun examples. It was actually playing gin rummy was worse than uninstalling the app. If you were a new user, older user, it's fine. New user, bad. Change your messaging so you don't focus on gin rummy, focus on a better game, get better attention. I suck at gambling, so. All right, and then uh, the biggest indicator of churn for an e-commerce app, this is cool. It's using a gift card for your first purchase, we found out. So if somebody uses a gift card for the first purchase, they're likely to churn, send them something else to encourage them to stay. And flipping this, we can tell your biggest retention propensities are a loyalty program. Maybe get someone started in your loyalty program if they check out with a gift card. We just did this for another app, and it was if someone adds things to a wish list for their app on their first day, churn, high likelihood. So you can fix that. But wait, there's more. So if I can know what events lead to churn, then I can tell if a user is doing these events, how likely each individual user is to churn, or stay, or purchase, or whatever. How we do it, again, science. Um, all the dots are events. The size of the dot is how often the event is done. The lines between them shows if you do one thing, what are you most likely to do next? The thickness of the line is how often it's done. And the closeness to the center uh, is how likely you are to check out, in this case, because that's in the center. Um, so, you know, if you churn, you're not likely to check out. If you open the app, you're less likely. But you get some really interesting things. Like, you can't read it. But remove from cart is, a really, is actually pretty close to checking out. Doesn't make sense at first until you think about it. The only people who remove things from a cart are the people who are about to buy because they don't want garbage in their cart. So you can uncover all kinds of amazing things just from this. But if we know about a user a little bit, and then we know what they just did, we can tell what they are most likely about to do next. So what we do is we make this logic accessible to your existing tools. You can use us in Firebase, Brace, CleverTap, whoever. And we can surface things like you can set triggers on your churn risk. So it's cooler than predictive churn because the percentages matter. A couple quick examples. Uh, discounts, everyone loves sending discounts. It's not just the e-commerce folks, subscription folks do it too, free trials, things like that. When does it make sense? Should we do it holiday, overstocked, when the business unit says to? If somebody hasn't bought in a while, what is a while? Propensities give you another opportunity. We know if someone's 60 to 80% likely to purchase, a discount makes sense, right? Because they just need like something to kick them over the edge. If they're 90% likely to purchase, though, we shouldn't send a discount, because that's throwing money out the window. They're about to buy. Don't send them a discount. Lose money. This also is true of retention, everything. Uh, if you're only 20% likely to purchase, don't send a discount. That doesn't make any sense. They're not about to buy. Instead, send a product recommendation. Get them excited about something. And then when you send the discount, they will be excited to use it, right? Or maybe you send them something, and they're so excited, they just buy it. And we see that um, just putting product recommendations in to messaging gets huge engagement increases um, very quickly. So, and that's another form of propensity modeling, by the way, looking at your entire catalog and saying, which of these four and a half million items will the user be interested in next? Propensities. Um, and then just examples of, this was from an e-commerce customer with 13 and a half million active users. Um, triggering on propensities versus triggering on events. It's much more powerful. We can also use propensities to find the right message timing. So this isn't like intelligent timing where we're looking at past, when does a user engage? We're looking at the future, when are they most likely to engage next? I won't explain what this means. Well, I can explain what it means, but I won't explain in detail unless you want that. We can do it later. But it basically shows that it almost doesn't matter what copy you send, there is a much bigger impact on timing. If I send you a push notification while you're driving, you will not read it, hopefully. Um, if I send it when you're bored on the couch, you're going to click it because you are bored. If you send one during my kid's soccer game, don't care, clicking it. So just in doing timing uh, optimization, we usually see good increases in opens, just from timing. So this is actually real timing data from a real app. This is based on propensities again. When will people interact with the app? Some interesting things, you can see that Tuesday uh, morning, mid-afternoon, later, not super late at night, is their biggest cohort. So sending it their best time, this will all be, you're welcome to take pictures. It will be radically different from your app, I promise. Um, the second biggest cohort, though, is only Sunday night. 
So if I send my messaging at the best time, which this is, right? I got the most dots. A lot of users in this time. For an e-commerce app, this was 200K in sales. Great. We don't, I feel like I have to say we don't just do e-commerce. It's just they're really good for examples. But if you maximize this whole table, that was 4 million in sales. So when somebody asks you when's the best time to send a push notification, the answer is for who? So the old way, um, we had our flowchart. We had our sending the same message kind of at the same time with some routine level. Uh, we were sending our one message a day. Um, we were sending them all, like I said, at the same time. Uh, and we're throwing out money out the window for all the reasons that I just told you. Uh, the new way, I'd like to show you what a real user journey looks like. So first of all, we're going to take that and throw that out. OK, this is what a real user journey looks like. And a lot of people haven't seen this, which is why it's wicked cool. So this is user activity, these gray humps. These are the events that we really, really care about. So we look at all of them, but we especially track the ones we care about. And these blue dots are messages. What you'll notice is somebody does something, and then they stop. We send messages. The AI slows down our message cadence. What you can't see is we're trying different messages at this time. So like this might be one appeal to value. This is an appeal to quality. This is an appeal to something. We finally get activity. We encourage them. They do an action, and you'll see our messaging volume picks up. This would have been a dead user after six weeks. We brought them back to life. This is another example. This one is e-commerce. We send a message, we get activity. The activity stalls. We, we slow down our cadence so they don't churn. Send them another message, get activity. Send discounts, try to encourage them to come back, and finally drive for the sale. We do it over and over and over. And you can see some people don't get very many messages. Some people get a ton of messages, but they're very active. Right? So that's OK. So if we send these people, if we send the first people more, they churn. If we send this person less, they don't activate enough. Right? So it's a problem on both sides. What's the best frequency? For who? And you can see some of our retention graphs. It, it works really, really well. So if we use existing events for our triggers, they're based on the past. What have you done? Or even if you haven't appeared in seven days, that's something you have done. You have, have not appeared. Um, we need to build our rigid rules and journeys, because again, that's what the tools do. We send the same messaging to everyone, because somebody who has just purchased is the same as somebody else who has just purchased, for all we know. Um, and we have inefficient user targeting and segmentation, because we're only able to base on a small subset of events and properties. So if we use propensities, they're based on the future. This is my favorite GIF, in case you're wondering. Uh, we can be flexible based on user needs, right? Their timing, their content, because we're looking at when they are likely to interact, not when they have. We have unique messaging based on user likelihoods. What are they, you know, like we talked about with the discounts. And then we can allow our users to segment themselves. So by the way that they respond to messaging and when they respond to messaging and how frequently they respond to messaging, we can kind of tailor that to that individual user. And it works. We got more stats. If you want stats, we got stats. Questions? Over there. I'll run over to you. Oh. He's running. He's running to you. Running. And I didn't mention chat GPT, except for the first slide, right? Huh? I did. Crap. Someone was counting. I was so close. Hello. I hear something. And talking, but I don't know. Does this sound? This sounds very low, right? There we go. We're there low. we go. Perfect. Uh, so thank you for the lecture. I have a question. Like you mentioned yeah. a lot of personalization parameters for based on user properties, like how to target the messages. But the question is, how do you get this personalization parameters? Like, you know, like you mentioned, like the, the specific schedule for the specific person or um, like football, football, soccer game that this mm -hmm. person might attend. You might not get to the stage when you get so much data. It's like you get the da data maybe based on the usage, but if the usage hasn't started yet based on the specific user, how do you get this data? Yep, so one is we ingest all events like I talked about, um, but that doesn't tell us about that. Data collected for all users can help us guide individual users. 
right? Mm -hmm. So I can build, I can understand that this user looks like these other users, and then use all of that other data to help that specific user. So even if a specific event hasn't happened yet, or in data science called the cold start problem, so you do it with a recommender. Nobody's bought anything yet. What can I send you if you haven't bought anything yet? We're allowed to build a database of what we think is going to work best for this user, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we do is testing, and re I won't get into it, but one-to-one -one control matching. So instead of using like a holdout group or control group, we find users who are very similar one-to-one. -one. This user is very similar to this user for this specific property we care about, and that's at the level we do our testing. So it allows us to test really quickly. And it also works for the schedule? That's how we do timing, yeah. So we'll find like, let's say there, we break the day into 35 time slots. So let's say we find a users, a group of users who are very active on Thursday night. We will break the user up and test a few of them at different times, and that will teach us if generally a certain other time is good or if this is just a bad time for this user group, right? So we cluster them by what they're interested in and then test them in a very controlled way. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes? We got more, so nope. he's first because I happen to be standing here. Thank you for the pre presentation. Yeah. Um, for a fitness app, can you say, uh, which uh, or what data would be the most beneficial in finding out if the user is going to uh, purchase? Like, uh, All uh, of it. Or, <laughs> yeah, but uh, which data should I start gathering if I haven't gathered it yet? Uh, or uh, maybe you can mention like top three. For, for us, it's literally events. So I'll say this. So if you look at like demographics and so, I mean, if you look at basic segmentation, right? So if I look at demographics or look at psychographics or behavioral or whatever, we found that like demographics don't really matter. Past activity kind of matters, but kind of not, because like, let's say you're doing really well working out, but then your kids start school, or goes on summer break. All your old data's moot, right, for you, but other people's work. So what we focus on is really that event stream data, which you likely already have, it's just usually not used well. It usually sits somewhere and you can query it every once in a while and make a segment or something. Um, but what we've seen is you, you already have it. You just need to feed it to a model to start getting this data. It will tell you what's most important. Is that helpful or did I, did I dodge it? Oh. You probably have it. I would say you already have the data. We, there's no point in like trying to pick the best three at this point until you run it through a model and then you can tell actually what your best three are. So the good news is you have it and you can do this. It's not hard, you can probably find somebody on Fiverr who can do it. Um, it's just doing it, right? Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you for the presentation as well. Thank you. Um, is there a minimum amount of user base uh, where it begins that the propensity models are more accurate? Like, is there, because I can imagine you need a lot of data for it to be. It's surprising how, how few data points you can have. Um, the example I tell people is if I want to know what my wife wants for dinner, I can ask the entire neighborhood, and then I can ask the city I live in, and I can ask my entire state, but if I go ask her, like she, she can give me a better answer because she actually knows. So part of it is our, our matching, our control matching and matching individual user to individual user. As long as we have enough variety we can. So we're working with, we have apps as small as 5,000. Um, we have apps that are north of 20 something million. Um, it, it really comes down to that control group and matching that allows us to, I get the question of statistical significance a lot and I go back to the same example with my wife. I can have great statistical significance, totally wrong answer. It's about the quality of the data you have more than quantity. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you so much, very interesting. Uh, one question, does the model adjust with time? So the, okay. Yeah, we, so we never stop testing, and this is really funny because we get the question of like, what if you send a message to someone that they don't care about? People are very worried. What if somebody likes horror movies and I send them a kid's movie and they don't have kids? I'm like, you do that today. Like everybody, I'm sorry, we all do, right? How many messages do you get that are totally irrelevant to you? Happens all the time. Um, so one thing that we do, like I said, with that timing test is we never assume that things are static. We are constantly running tests slow and controlled within our group, we always have a group that's constantly testing. Because things happen back to school, like we've talked about today, wars, recessions, COVID, we need to be prepared for all of it. Everybody's lives are changing, so we don't assume that anything is really static. So we balance what they call in data science, the, um, what is it? It sounds really awful, because it's explore, exploit, trade-off. So we're always, we always keep an explore group so that we're managing that shift. 
No, you don't set up the test. We continuously test. So what you do is you load a bunch of messages. Most people who use us have anywhere from 10 to, we have like somebody who has over a million different messages. Our model's just going through and picking message, user, time, test. All right, good. Nope, okay. Does that work? And managing that trade-off. Yeah. All right. This side of the room asked five questions. Does the other side have any, or are we all good to let Jim go eat? <laughs> eat data. <laughs> going once. Going, OK, it's gone. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Jim.